Hello and welcome to the webinar, Transmission Planning and Cost Allocation. My name is Megan Billingsley and I'm glad you could join us. Before getting started, we have a few simple housekeeping matters for our viewers. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find some application widgets for your use. These widgets are all resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to optimize your desktop space. The slides will advance automatically throughout the presentation. To enlarge the slides, click the Enlarge Slides button in the top right-hand corner of your presentation window. And now to take us through the presentation and discussion, I'd like to hand it off to Jamie Saunders. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, where we will explore FERC's recent transmission planning and cost allocation NOPR. Today's agenda includes a brief introduction, roundtable discussion, demo, and closing remarks. This NOPR proposes significant reforms to the regional transmission planning process, regional cost allocation process, and FERC's Order 1000 for right of first refusal. As FERC alumni, today's panelists are no strangers to me and no strangers to most. Our first panelist is Mr. John Wellinghoff, CEO and founder of Grid Policy Inc. and Mr. Neil Chatterjee, Senior Advisor at Hogan Levels. Both were former FERC chairman with John Wellinghoff serving as one of the longstanding chairman at FERC and Neil Chatterjee serving as commissioner and chairman at FERC. Welcome Mr. Wellinghoff, Mr. Chatterjee. Thank you for having us. So it seems like transmission expansion has really uh, taken a critical role in today's conversations around renewable energy, especially with companies and utilities um, discussing their decarbonization and sustainability efforts. It also seems like a lot has changed in terms of energy landscape and shifting priorities um, of energy resources, energy investment, and other areas of critical infrastructure. Um, so the first question is, can you both discuss something that was a priority while you were at FERC and how that key area that was once prioritized has kind of changed in terms of perspective or priority in the current energy landscape? I'll start with you, uh, John. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll lead it off since I um, initiated um, Order 1000, which is the order that we're talking about today that's that's being modified in a, in a not notice of uh, proposed rulemaking by FERC. Um, <clears throat> we were just at, at the time of establishing Order 1000, which, which came off of uh, uh, a prior order um, related to transmission planning, trying to establish a framework uh, for the RTOs, the regional transmission organizations, and for the other regional planning authorities outside of the RTOs uh, to do transmission planning and cost allocation uh, in a reasonable, rational, and uh, and structured way. Uh, at that time, uh, back in, in 2009, 2010, when we started this effort, uh, there was a, a degree of renewable energy that was coming into the grid, uh, and it was starting to interconnect. Uh, but <clears throat> Uh, at, at that time, we had we hadn't anticipated uh, the level of uh, interconnections that we're seeing today. The level of uh, increased uh, both solar and wind energy that is trying to uh, interconnect into the grid, and how that is really um, dynamically and dramatically uh, impacting the overall uh, transmission planning and cost allocation issues that are are facing FERC. So. Um, I'd say back in, in the 2009-2010 time period, we were looking at setting up that, that ultimate um, framework, but uh, I don't think we fully anticipated uh, how rapidly uh, things would change and how that framework did, did need to be modified, as FERC is trying to modify it now to uh, sort of catch up uh, to this uh, very rapidly changing landscape. Absolutely, absolutely. Great points made there. And I was around at FERC when Order 1000 was passed and could remember, um, you know, just it being a really major um, order and a very big deal in industry. Uh, Neil, what are your thoughts around something that was a priority when you were at FERC and, and how that looks now in terms of uh, the energy landscape we're presented with? 
Uh, yeah, thank you for the question and for the opportunity to uh, be with you all today. Uh, look, a lot of the work I did at FERC, quite frankly, was building on the good work that was started by my predecessors, uh, uh, including and chiefly uh, John Wellinghoff. Um, I am a big believer in competition. I believe that competition uh, drives cost containment, uh, drives innovation. Uh, and I was really uh, uh, thrilled to see some of the efforts that uh, Chairman Wellinghoff uh, and uh, his colleagues and, and that iteration of FERC pursued during their tenure. Uh, and tried to really build on a lot of their work from Order 1000 to other areas as well. Uh, John was a real leader uh, on demand response and really pushed the commission into the 21st century uh, to embrace DR. And I think in many ways set the regulatory ecosystem in a way that allowed innovative new technologies to compete and to be compensated for all of their attributes. And so I really came in and tried to build on that. That's the beauty of FERC uh, being an independent bipartisan agency is the work of the uh, commission tends to be technical uh, and, and successive versions of the commission build off their predecessors work. And so what I tried to do in the distributed energy space was remove barriers to entry for innovative new technologies like energy storage, batteries, uh, as well as aggregated distributed energy resources, which in many ways I felt was, you know, kind of capping some of the work that John started on uh, DR and moving us to a more distributed future, um, but also focus on transmission. Look, I had wanted to tackle transmission in a major way. I had wanted to ensure that uh, the benefits that John had uh, envisioned when uh, enacting Order 1000 would be realized. Um, but what I quickly recognized was that transmission and, and order 1000 and planning and cost allocation are like a really, really wound up ball of yarn. And once you start pulling on a thread, it can unravel very quickly. And there were other things that I wanted to achieve during my time at the commission. I really feel the chair, the, the majority of the work that the chair and commissioners do is work that comes in response to filings at the commission, but probably about a quarter of a chairman's time, uh, if he or she chooses, can be uh, spent on, on, on sort of discretionary projects that are of interest to the chair. And I really wanted to tackle transmission, but I thought it would take up so much bandwidth that it would have prevented uh, the staff and I from really focusing on some of these other objectives that we pursued. So we tried more targeted fixes to try and make Order 1000 work. We tried to bring some clarity to the commission's ROE policy. We tried to revisit the way, uh, that's ROE for transmission. We tried to revisit the way that the commission um, looked at incentives uh, to not necessarily continue to incentivize the riskiest projects, but the ones that would be most beneficial to consumers. And in a lot of ways, I think because of the work that both John's commission and mine did, we cleared the decks to free up this iteration of the commission to really zero in on these complicated transmission issues. Uh, and so we definitely did some of the precursor work, but the big challenge lies ahead. And I applaud uh, Chairman Glick and uh, and my former colleagues for, for really tackling this. Absolutely. Um, uh, there's no, no, no question that some really impactful orders came out under both of your tenures. Um, that, that really kind of paved the way for us to be able to tackle some of these issues that we're seeing right now in terms of transmission interconnection, transmission expansion, um, cost allocation and planning, and really just kind of move things along so that um, we can continue to expand, invest, and develop. Um, I'll move into the NOPA and some of the finer points of it. And one of the proposals that the commission made was to expand the horizon for transmission planning to a 20 year outlook. Um, they talked about MISO's um, MVP process, and they also cited other RTOs and ISO's processes um, that have longer term horizons that ap appear to unlock um, efficiencies and cost, uh, uh, cost effective uh, solutions. So do you all believe that with the expansion of the time horizons, it'll unlock competition? And I'll start with you, John. Well, like Neil, I, I'm a big proponent of competition, and I was a big 
proponent and supporter of the ROFR of the right of first refusal in Order 1000, that we wrote into Order 1000, uh, that is eliminating the right of first refusal uh, to ensure that um, competitive projects uh, could uh, come to the surface in this planning, these planning processes and that we could get as much competitive transmission as possible. But, um, you know, with respect to the the issue of, of, of longer term planning horizon uh, that's proposed in the in the in the uh, the NOPER, um, I, I'm somewhat conflicted in, in this sense. Um, I, I think it, it could help us uh, with um, fostering more competition because certainly if you look out to a longer planning horizon, you're certainly going to look at more robust uh, transmission um, requirements, uh, probably more uh, inter-regional planning, um, and maybe even, um, um, God forbid, we even even get to inter, inter interconnect planning. You know, across the the two uh, big interconnects in the U.S. and and maybe even into Texas. Who knows? Um, you know, ma major lines into Texas, but. Um, if you look out into those longer horizons, that's certainly going to foster that. But looking into a longer horizon where I'm conflicted is there are so many variables and unknowns when you start getting out further into um, the future with respect to what's going to happen with energy that it's going to be very difficult to assess, you know, what are the right choices. And let, let me give you some statistics that may give you some ideas of of, of how I'm looking at this. If you look at the projections of how many electric vehicles will be on the road in the U.S., it's projected that by 2030, there'll be over 20 million new electric vehicles on the road. And if you take the battery capacity in those electric vehicles in 2030, you realize that that total battery capacity is more than the total capacity of all the current electric generation in the United States. So as, as Neil was talking about, uh, we have this whole sector that, um, you know, we, we do have to, to, to thank Chairman Chatterjee for emphasizing and promoting, and that is the battery storage uh, behind the meter and also distributed energy resources in order 2222. <clears throat> These two areas are going to become increasingly important going into the future, going into the future, especially with electric vehicles coming into the fore. And so how they are going to impact transmission and the needs for transmission looking out 20 years is going to be very difficult to assess. So from a competitive standpoint, um, yes, I think it could be beneficial to have a, a longer planning horizon, but there's going to be huge challenges in really trying to, um, you know, accurately forecast where we're going to be, you know, that far out. Yeah, I totally agree um, with Chairman Wellinghoff on this. And this is just, you know, another example of why this is so complex and a difficult of an undertaking. Um, I do think that the longer time horizon will provide those benefits. But John's exactly right. You know, 20 years is a lifetime in energy policy. We don't know what innovations and what structural changes within the way that Americans generate, distribute and consume power will, will come about. And, you know, um, you, you know, you want to try and build in some flexibility for those unknowns, um, but but it's difficult to do. Um, I do appreciate uh, that the commission is taking a very deliberative approach, seeking comments and reply comments to really have a robust record and, and make the best durable decision that they can. The one odd thing that they did, uh, and John referred to it, is they actually took a step back in terms of competition. Uh, they didn't even just maintain the, the status quo. Uh, they restored the, uh, the rofer that John so wisely uh, had eliminated. And I found that to be really, really curious. It didn't seem to square with the broader objectives of what the, uh, the, the, the planning rule was, was seeking to achieve. And I also think most seriously, it, it introduced a huge element of legal risk. And we've seen some recent court decisions that have raised questions about uh, the, the legality of these state <laughs> rofer laws 
And I would hate to see what is an otherwise thoughtful planning rule go down because of the, the legal infirmity of restoring the, uh, the ROFR. And so I found it to be a peculiar step. I think the comments that were filed uh, uh, this past August in the docket uh, made some really compelling arguments and some great suggestions for how the commission could move forward uh, and away from the ROFR. And I'm hoping uh, that the combination of those comments coupled with the recent Fifth Circle, Circuit ruling uh, will give the, the commission the encouragement it needs uh, to do the right thing and, and really focus on, on, on doubling down on competition, not moving backwards away from it. Absolutely. Um, I think you all made some good points, especially uh, uh, as it relates to the right of first refusal. So let's jump in there um, since we're since we're on that topic. What are your thoughts on on the permitting a right of first refusal in the NOPER? Now, it is conditioned upon joint projects. But what what are your thoughts around that? How are um, specifically non incumbent transmission developers um, supposed to address competition in this space if, um, you know, on one hand, Order 1000 um, eliminates the right of first refusal, and now the NOPER is permitting it based on, on conditions. And I'll start with you, John. Well, it, it's going to be very difficult unless, you know, the uh, final rule, um, you know, retreats back to to the position of the uh, original Order 1000. It's going to be extremely difficult for uh, any um, competitive uh, providers of transmission to uh, effectively offer projects, um, you know, going forward. You know, and, and there's another category of, of, of transmission technology that the Commission has supported so far and, and ho hopefully they will, in fact, um, also um, provide some uh, indication that these technologies can be supportive as, uh, or be competitive as well. And that's when, uh, the area I'm talking about is GETS, which is uh, grid enhancing technologies, which are a whole category of technologies like uh, load flow controls, like dynamic line rating, like uh, software topology, uh, technologies that can be put on very quickly on the transmission system can make the system more efficient, work more effectively, um, and ultimately uh, uh, ensure that that system uh, is 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 used fully utilized and optimized. Whereas right now our our transmission system as it exists is extremely underutilized. Um, uh, you know, utilization factor is is certainly way less than fifty percent. It's probably uh, closer to 20 to 30 percent. And uh, if we put on these technologies, we can increase that utilization factor substantially. So, you know, I'm hoping that uh, the, con the commission will consider where they've gone with the ROFR uh, in their final rule here. And I hope that they also consider, you know, adding uh, competitive aspects to uh, things like grid enhancing technologies. I'm, I'm hoping that they go in that direction. Um, and if they don't, you know, then it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very um, uh, incumbent centric. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the uh, track record has demonstrated that uh, it's very expensive uh, for um, consumers when uh, only incumbents are allowed to, to build these uh, types of technologies, both the GETS technologies and the traditional transmission technology uh, expansions uh, into the system. Um, I think we'll get uh, a more expensive system, and I don't think the, the system will be built out as rapidly uh, without competition. Just to build on that, um, in looking at the ROFR, uh, I'm actually optimistic. You know, I, I know all five of the, the sitting commissioners uh, pretty well. I'd be surprised if the votes are there, particularly after the comments uh, that have come in, uh, to move forward with uh, the ROFR as it was uh, the restoration of the ROFR as, as it was initially proposed in uh, in the NOPR. Uh, you know, the beauty of a NOPR is you get to table a number of issues and 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 seek comments and reply comments, and then the commission can decide to move forward or not. It's not a, a final binding rule, and so um, I actually would be surprised if there are. 
uh, a majority of votes on the commission to to move forward with that restoration of the ROFR as proposed. Uh, but to me, simply striking that isn't sufficient. Um, I think John's right. I think there's a lot more that can be done uh, to really ensure that um, that the the benefits of competition uh, are available to uh, to consumers. And uh, I, I'm hopeful that the commission will take a step. You know. Um, Working uh, with John, who was a real leader in this area uh, during my tenure, you know, we looked at uh, dynamic line ratings and 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 had uh, a, a technical conference on it. We looked at grid enhancing technologies, and um, I think beginning that exploration has had an effect. I was at a conference last week with a bipartisan congressional delegation, and the topic of uh, grid enhancing technologies came up. And, you know, a couple of years ago, if I had talked about Gets in front of a group of members of Congress, they would have said, wait, those are those little hot dog looking things that you see uh, hanging from transmission lines. And now they're having like a real substantive conversation about it. And so uh, I'm very encouraged to see um, the the opportunities here. And now it's just a question of the commission, um, you know, uh, moving forward and, and, and really advancing the ball in this critically important area. Absolutely. I, I would agree. Um you know, when I read through um, through the NOPA and I saw the writer first refusal change, um, I had I had a feeling that there was going to be a lot of comment around that, um, especially uh, just in my career, having been at a non-incumbent transmission developer uh, organization and, and understanding the benefits that exist um, through having that level of competition. I just I think it's important for them to to really really revisit that and make sure. Um, that that is uh, the most viable path forward. Um, but speaking of incentives, um, let's let's discuss uh, the proposed CWIP incentive, the removal of the CWIP incentive as an option um, for transmission providers as they uh, uh, develop uh, certain transmission facilities. Um, again, I want to say it was correct me, Order 679 that uh, passed that implemented a number of incentives to transmission developers, CWIP being one of the more popular ones, just providing that funding up front through cost recovery uh, methodologies. Um, so what, what are you all, what are your thoughts on the removal or just not, not uh, transmission providers not having the ability to claim the CWIP incentive any longer? Do you think that um, that will affect transmission development or just the number of developers that you have interested in certain projects? I guess if I could weigh in, I mean, I, I have to come come back to my, my old consumer protection days. I, I never was a fan of, of CWIP or construction work in progress. Um, when I was a consumer advocate in Nevada, I, and I still have have problems with, with that particular concept. I mean, um, you know, and and especially to the extent that that you you would start introducing competition and promoting competition uh, into the system, I, I I don't think it's a, it's a necessary element of a competitive um, structure or structure for financial structure for uh, a competitive uh, provision of transmission. So it's it it's not something I I've ever been a fan of. I don't have much to add on that, to be totally honest. I, w I wasn't as focused uh, uh, on, on CWIP during my tenure, and so uh, I can't uh, speak eloquently to uh, to what the impact of that will be. Do you all have any thoughts around um, other incentives that the commission could probably offer to help scale up the expansion of transmission development? Um, that is just really a significant topic right now. We have uh, tons of generation coming online or just, just sitting in queue, um, and some require just the expansion of, of transmission assets. So what incentives can they offer to really try to drive uh, investment from utilities and other non-incumbent transmission developers? At, at a moment in time where there's a big focus on competition and markets, um, and you've got, you know, hopefully some uh, potential for market expansion in certain regions of the country. Um, I was a little bit surprised that one of the early actions the commission took was to pare back the RTO adder. Uh, to me, um, it seemed odd that in a moment in which we were focusing on the need to really build out transmission, coupled with uh, seeing the benefits of competition expanded to more and more Americans, um, you know, to me that 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 is a, an area in which you can protect consumers, uh, get that requisite inve uh, investment from utilities, uh, 
um, and encourage, you know, market participation and growth. Um, so that was one area that, that jumped out to me. Uh, also, the, the transmission incentives, uh, NOPER, that the commission authored during my tenure as chair, um, you know, uh, uh, now Chairman Glick was really in favor with uh, a number of the uh, components of that. Uh, I don't know that he would have voted for it as I drafted it, but um, there's still a lot of good work there. We, we didn't complete it during my tenure at the commission. Uh, it is still hanging out there. And uh, I'd love to see uh, uh, Chairman Glick pick that back up and, and see if we can't. You know, it, it, it's really been since the Energy Policy Act of 2005, uh, you know, almost 17 years ago that the commission has revisited its incentives policy. Uh, I think it's time to do so. Uh, a lot of the work has already been done, and I'd love to see the, uh, the, the staff and the commission go pick that back up. Let me go in a little bit different direction here. And, and Neil and I usually don't differ. I'm not sure we're, we're differing on this one. But first of all, on the, the RTO adder, um, I, I, I'm not a fan of that. And, and that's because uh, I'm a firm believer, like Pat Wood was, that there should be a um, requirement that RTOs are everywhere. And so if you have RTOs everywhere, obviously you don't need uh, anybody's incentive to join one. Uh, they should be, just be required. Uh, RTOs make sense. Uh, independent system operators uh, should operate the system in every part of the country. But, you know, that, that aside, on, on the in incentive issue, we have to recognize that we're starting from a broken system. The broken system is we reward people for spending money. We don't reward people for being efficient. So what we need to do is move, in my opinion, to more of a performance-based, and if you want to call it incentive, you can call it whatever you wanted to call it, but a performance-based financial uh, compensation system that, that compensates a transmission developer not for how much they spend on their transmission line, but how efficient they are in their throughput, how efficient they are in getting the throughput in the, through the line. The, the higher uh, utilization factor of that line, the higher that particular developer should be rewarded for the building of that line. And if we, if we, if we change our system and change our view, we have a much more cost-effective, you know, lower cost and efficient transmission system in this country. And right now it's, it's, it's a system that really is broken. It's funny you mentioned that I can remember uh, in being at FERC and then, uh, just looking at uh, formula rates, doing formula rate audits, and just the sheer amount of uh, capital, change in capital from year to year that you'd see in, in transmission development. Um, and what I thought was really neat uh, when I was at a non-incumbent transmission developer was um, one thing they did to try to cap costs was to uh, make cost containment commitments. That's the closest, closest I've ever seen to something that it's not performance based, but it's it's commitments made that kind of allow for um, accountability and responsibility in terms of spend. Um, so I, I appreciate that comment. Um, I'm going to move on to one more topic that was in the NOPR. And the NOPR talks a lot about stakeholder collaboration. Um, and it introduces a new state agreement process which requires transmission providers in each transmission region to seek agreement around regional cost allocation methods for state and with state entities within the transmission planning region. Do you guys have any concern around that process? Do you think that this type of collaboration during the transmission planning process around regional cost allocation with some of the state uh, uh, commissions may uh, extend, significantly extend the transmission planning process? Um, and what, what benefits do you see from this type of collaboration? Well, to lead off, I certainly uh, think collaboration with the states should be encouraged and expanded. Um, you know, if, if it, if it, if it uh, extends the process by, you know, a couple of months or whatever, um, I think that's a good thing in the sense that uh, ultimately the states have to be on board. I mean, ultimately, it, we've seen over and over again, um, you know, one of the primary reasons that, you know, transmission is not uh, more um, developed in this country is in part because 
the states haven't been brought on board and the states uh, aren't in agreement with the proposed development. And so, you know, as, to, as such, I think it's always good to could involve the states. I agree with that completely. Uh, I think the commission did a very good job from the get go by uh, you know, announcing this joint task force uh, with NARUC uh, and, and the commission. They've got 10 commissioners representing a diverse uh, array of regions in the country, you know, kind of working together collaboratively because uh, that's the only way this is going to work is to get buy in from the states. Um, look, uh, you know, some of the things being contemplated in Congress right now would empower FERC. Uh, to sort of, you know, uh, overcome opposition from the states. And, uh, you know, what was funny is the, the the chair and the commissioners have said, even if granted that authority, they don't think they'd use it. Uh, I think there's a real desire in, in trying to achieve that collaboration. Will it make things more complicated? Sure. Um, I've had state regulators tell me, a couple of them in confidence, that they could never say it aloud, but they would love for FERC to, to roll them because these issues are difficult. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's ultimately not sustainable in the long term. You've got to get state buy in. And so I think this kind of collaboration is crucially important. And uh, I applaud the steps the commission has taken to date uh, to really bring the states to the table and, and try and work through these complicated issues uh, in the NOPER hand in glove. And, and, and I would say I, I, I agree with that. Collaboration uh, with key stakeholders is always critical, especially to a process like this that involves so many complexities. Um, and so many challenging and complex issues that touch almost every state um, that is working on uh, energy transition or just even energy uh, critical infrastructure expansion. Um, so uh, in rounding this off, uh, I wanted to talk about what, what to look forward to. Transmission providers at this point are uh, and RTOs are looking at at this NOPER, and I wanted to know if you were to give them some advice in terms of like key inputs and just things that they should look at. I know there's a lot of drivers when you're looking at developing projects, uh, internal rates of returns, which sometimes significantly rely on incentives that you're granted uh, and also on your ability to have access to capital. Uh, what would you say in terms of uh, either financial inputs or, or operational metrics that some of these transmission providers should kind of focus on um, as they go out and uh, uh, um, bid on some of these projects that will come out through, through different uh, transmission expansion processes through the RTOs and ISOs? Well, they're going to have to look at all the data, and, and data is going to be extremely important in this process. You know, you know, and one, one thing we haven't talked about that that, that is – sort of been floated by some of the commenters into the the NOPER proposal is an independent uh, transmission monitor, like we have an independent market monitor now. Um, so certainly, I think, uh, you know, developers um, and uh, competitive developers, hopefully that, that will be able to come to the table, um, you know, need to be able to get the data, need to be able to look at that data and analyze it and, and see what has been done in those regions in the past uh, with respect to transmission development and uh, looking at um, cost per line mile uh, and other essential data that can be found in, you know, for form one, for example, and other, uh, other uh, documents that are available at, at FERC, uh, you know, that now have been digitized and, and can be utilized in a, in a much more efficient fashion. Um, it's those kinds of things that, that I think uh, the smart developer is going to want to get after. Agree with that completely. It's data, data, data. Uh, look, these are these are huge, risky, high capex investments, uh, and and you've got to have you know maximum you know information for smart planning. And I think one of the underrated things that uh, the commission has done is make this simple change to digitization uh, to make these forms more easily searchable. And comparable, um, and and get that uh, uh, you know instantaneous data. Uh, I think it's so crucial moving forward, and will be a huge understated component of uh, successful execution. Well, thank you, Neil and John. Uh, this has been great. Um, we definitely discussed some some interesting um, uh, tidbits that have been in the NOPER, and uh, I appreciate a lot of you all's opinions and feedback. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Luke uh, so we can take a look at some of this critical data that we're saying uh, some of the transmission providers should look at 
And in particularly, I remember being in audits at FERC and um, having to do this manually, having to search all of the form ones, pull them by year, uh, use Excel, um, type this stuff in and do a lot of different um, assessments. We did risk assessments in terms of uh, trying to figure out who was being audited um, in a certain year and a financial risk assessment was just one of the elements. So I'll pass this over to, to you, Luke. Awesome. Thanks, Jamie. And yeah, thank you so much, Neil and John, for a lot of your important input. I definitely want to emphasize kind of the last few points that you made. What the FERC has done with all this data and more specifically tying into what you all talked about, what the FERC has done is implemented XBRL as a part of standardizing all of their financial forms, specifically what we want to talk about is the FERC's Form 1 and 13Q. So as I'm sharing my screen here, what that really has allowed us to do and what we're doing here at Age Data is taking that data and not just making it more accessible, but also machine readable. So what that means is we can actually take this data from these static PDFs and then actually make it dynamic, make it alive and make it a living, breathing uh, data set. So what, that, I, what I've done with all of this data is when we're looking at the transmission numbers specifically, I've created a few different visualizations really touching on a lot of the items that we've discussed within this webinar. So we're talking about Hey, it's not just transmission planning, but transmission planning takes into account all the different verticals that an electric company can work in. It's generation, it's transmission, it's distribution. So I've kind of highlighted a few different things here on the generation, distribution, transmission, as well as we're talking about uh, rate base and uh, how companies are impacted by different incentives, say with construction work in progress. That really impacts a lot of what happens in uh, rate cases and how companies calculate rate base. So I want to go ahead and just quickly get started within the distribution transmission plan. If we're really wanting to look at historical data, but also data on an ongoing basis, what the FERC has done with XBRL really has set the groundwork for having a really good data infrastructure to capture data on whatever uh, actual policy is set in stone after the NOPR. If we're making a lot of changes, into how companies are accounting for these different financial items, we have a really good infrastructure to capture that information on an ongoing basis. So what we're looking at right now is different distribution and transmission plant values as reported by various companies that are FERC regulated. So right now we're looking at Alabama Power. Um, really, we can look at any other company. So if we want to look at a specifically a transmission company, of course, they're not focusing on distribution, but if we want to switch it over to transmission plant, we can see how the transmission plant values have been changing on a quarterly basis going all the way back to 2011. So as part of this XBRL mandate, we have uh, seen all this data being retroactively applied in XBRL all the way back to 2011 and an ongoing basis going forward. So as new filings come in, we can see, hey, are companies actually hitting their goals and their targets with their transmission uh, items. Are they actually investing in transmission? Is that growing? Is it growing at a specific rate that we want to see? If you're a state regulator, this stuff is great because if you can actually say, hey, we regulate a transmission company and we want to be able to see if they're investing like we think they should be, then this is a great way to capture that. But it's also good for a lot of private companies to be able to come in and see, are we actually hitting our goals as we have negotiated with our regulators? So what we've been able to do is provide that central environment that both the regulators and the companies that they regulate can operate with the same data set and be able to talk the same language. So we can see all that data for every single FERC regulated company going as far as we want. So we can uh, be able to compare that. What we're looking at here is actually American transmission systems as an average against a peer group. So if you want to reset an average or a median on a set peer group that you're looking at, you can do that here. So for example, if I want to look at say Commonwealth Edison, it actually throws ATS in the back, takes Commonwealth Edison out, and then resets the peer group average. So you can actually benchmark on that number going all the way back. And that's really, really important because to be able to do this, kind of what you talked about, Jamie, to be able to do something like this in the old way would take you weeks of PDFs and Excels. And I can just do it in seconds here. Um, kind of going back to some of the other things I wanted to bring up is generation mix. As we're trying to account for 
transmission planning, automatically that's going to be accounting for where is generation coming from? What kind of generation is it? And we can actually capture that via the FERC Form 1. So what we're looking at is can we look at hydro conventional generation, hydro pump generation, nuclear generation, uh, steam generation, and then this kind of other generation category, which I know the FERC has also been interested in reforming how they account for that other, actually accommodating for specific renewables of having line items dedicated to uh, uh, solar and wind and various other renewable assets. We can actually capture that in the FERC form. I think that's some reforms that would be really, really good for the FERC to implement. Um, but what we can actually do is say, look at Florida Power and Light, and that's where we get that really big other that if we're able to break that down into, say, renewables for solar and wind, where, you know, we're looking at a Florida power and light, that's probably where most of their generation is coming from. And then I've actually overlaid power production expenses. So kind of that note that John brought up a little bit earlier, if we're actually able to say, hey, I want to look at power production expenses per generated megawatt hour for all these different generation types, or if we want to focus on the distribution or the transmission and distribution, we can focus specifically on the transmission O&M per line mile. So how much are we actually spending for every line mile that we're responsible for? Um, and then lastly, I really want to focus on the rate base. One of the main things I think a lot of our customers at HDA like to use our platform for is actually in preparation for rate cases and not just the uh, private sector where the companies are wanting to kind of experiment with how this data will look before they actually engage in a rate case, but also the regulators. If, for example, we do have a situation where CWIP is removed as an incentive, for a lot of different regulators on the state level, they do include CWIP. So being able to remove that from their rate-based calculations may be a tedious process. But in this case, you know, if I'm looking at Encore Electric Delivery, um, we can actually see all the individual components that will go into rate case. How much is it actually focused on the utility point? So the actual value of all of their assets. Um, if we're looking at other investments or the construction work in progress, we can actually highlight those down and, and quickly see how much of a portion of that rate base that consists of. So if I were to look at, say, uh, Georgia Power, then we're looking at construction work in, process, in progress as a much larger chunk of their overall rate base. And if we're looking at specifically transmission companies, that's going to be a huge uh component, a financial component that we're going to have to readjust how we capture information on and how we use it in preparation for rate cases, especially for formula rate plans. But we need the data in place first in order to do this quickly and efficiently and also do it in a way that is uh, visible for everyone else involved in the process. So this is kind of what we're focusing on here at HData is being able to provide all this data at the fingertips of all parties involved, being able to quickly access this information and taking advantage of what the FERC has done with x -Bureau. It's been a great initiative. Um, so I'll go ahead and hand it back to you, Jamie. Thank you, Luke. Um, that was actually extremely helpful and it was cool to see some of the features that HData has on its platform. Like I said, when I audited at FERC, um, we, we'd pull a number of Form 1s, you know, I'd be on three to four audits, and I'm pulling a number of Form 1s for scopes that range anywhere from 2014 to 2018 or, you know, 2011 to 2015. Sometimes they're larger scopes because you're not going in every year, so you have to cover, um, you know, more 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 of the uh, more of the landscape when you're, when you're going into audits. Um, and then just being on uh, the rate case side and Office of Administrative Litigation, looking at, you know, ROE trends and looking at rate bases and recovery items was um, a significant part um, of the job and just assessing um, how companies either have been recovering or how they compare to other utilities um, that are similar to them in terms of operations um, and complexity. So um, that demo was really helpful. And I, I wish that we had that around when, when I was at FERC doing a ton of that work um, more manually. Um, I want to thank both uh, John Wellinghoff and Neil Chatterjee for being with us. We really appreciated you guys. This was probably a, um, a really helpful conversation for most that are tuning in. Um, sometimes it's rare to get conversations around transmission. Um, there's a lot of conversation around generation, just 
uh, because of all the newness in terms of different renewable energy resources and advanced technologies that are connecting to the grid. But sometimes it's hard to find some really good, um, thorough assessments and opinions on uh, transmission uh, 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 transmission areas of, of interest, and, and especially on FERC, uh, a lot of the things that they've come up with in terms of NOPR. So we really appreciate you guys joining today. Thank you, Jamie. It was great being here. Appreciated the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to close out. We thank everyone for tuning into this webinar um, and really appreciate your time. Thank you. Jamie and our panelists, thank you so much for that insightful presentation. And before we sign off, we just want to thank you, our audience, for joining us today. This webinar will continue to be available on demand if you want to review anything that was discussed. Thanks again for watching.